Welcome to Penn State Dickinson Law's Profiles and Leadership Series. My name is Daryl Lim. I serve as the H. Laddie Montag Jr. Chair and Associate Dean for Research and Innovation at the Law School. This series offers an unparalleled opportunity to glean insights from top leaders who serve in government, education, the private sector, and civil society. In each episode, we invite these leaders to reflect on their journeys and share skills, core values, and qualities that make them the leaders they are today. I'm very pleased to welcome Judge Randall Rader. For over 25 years, Judge Rader has been a thought leader in the field of intellectual property law and jurisprudence. Judge Rader was appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit by President George H.W. Bush in 1990 and assumed the duties of Chief Judge on June 1, 2010. He was appointed to the U.S. Claims Court, now the U.S. Court of Federal Claims, by President Ronald Reagan in 1988. Since leaving the bench in 2014, Judge Rader has founded the Rader Group, initially focusing on arbitration, mediation, and legal counseling, and legal education services. Judge Rader has presided over a major arbitration under ICC rules in Paris, conducted mediations to settle ongoing litigation, joined the law faculty at Tsinghua University, conducted full credit courses at leading law schools in Washington, D.C., Seattle, Santa Clara, Bangkok, Seoul, Tokyo, Munich, and I'm sure many others. He's also consulted with major corporations and law firms on IP policy and litigation and advised foreign governments on international IP standards. Welcome. Thank you, Professor Lim. Daryl, it's good to be with you. Great to be with you. Why don't uh, we start with an announcement uh, that was recently released about you joining IUS Auto. Uh, tell us a little bit about this new chapter. Yeah, we, uh, yes, IUS Auto is uh, using AI primarily as a tool to advance intellectual property work at patent law firms, but also in valuation, uh, deal making, licensing. And uh, I think it has great promise for improving our administration of those topics. The, uh, yep. I, I guess I'd go on just to say, Daryl, that, you know, AI has great promise as a burgeoning area of innovation and invention. We uh, have often underestimated the power of, uh, of computer automaticity and reliability to aid our human endeavors. And so I'm very hopeful that this branch of uh, AI can also provide some uh, opportunities for improvement. And what do you see our primary role uh, in this engagement to be like? Well, uh, I think primarily I can advise them on ways to direct the AI so that it can do things like valuation. I, I think that is a challenging area where so much of the information you need to give proper value to intellectual property is confidential. And that's appropriate, but maybe AI can help us penetrate that confidentiality uh, barrier and give at least reliable estimates. And those reliable estimates can turn into a standard to help us properly uh, value licenses and intellectual property exchanges. Thanks. I, I want to ask you two related questions, uh, just stemming from your answer. First is on standards, and the second is on AI. And they're both related in a sense because we are grappling with these issues, not just nationally, but internationally. Uh, do you get a sense? that regulators, policymakers, judges don't really understand uh, 
the landscape sufficiently in order to either regulate or rule uh, in a useful way on these issues. Yes, I do. I think that uh, the you used a rather generic term. I'll focus mostly on judges. That uh, the judges that are making many of these rulings do not have advanced understanding of markets and licensing and the inner workings of managing an entire uh, portfolio. Uh, I, I say this a, a little bit based on my own experience, that uh, my eyes have been opened vastly to many aspects of, uh, of the IP market that I had a peripheral understanding of, but the details make a difference. And I have... Uh, profited from learning those details, which I'm sure continue to evade the judges and other policymakers who are uh, influencing the directions of intellectual property. So in Europe, there's been a uh, talk of regulating standard essential patents uh, at a bureaucratic level, the SCP regulation as it's called. Uh, what are your thoughts on having a government body determine uh, brand rates and require these obligations uh, that they are intending to impose on private parties? Now that would be uh, disastrous. Uh, the bureaucrats understand the market far less than the judges. At least the judges are receiving some kind of input from parties on both sides that uh, give, if not a complete picture, at least a more balanced picture. A bureaucrat, presuming from the outside without adequate input to understand the marketplace and impose a judgment on it would be a failure from the outset. Do you think uh, it, the the bureaucrats will succeed in pushing this through, or is that the opposition going to be sufficient to, to stop this? I have high hopes that there will be enough uh, uh, opposition from those who actually do understand the market and do have portfolios and do have uh, decided interests in having standards properly set and managed. I think if those people continue to prevail that uh, we won't have a bureaucratic state trying to determine things which ought to be left to individual agreement, frankly. It needs to be a matter of uh, the parties reaching a decision. And in the AI space, what worries you the most when it comes to AI and IP issues? Oh, that's pretty easy. There are security and, and uh, national warfare type interests, which can also be influenced greatly by uh, AI. I traveled recently to China as part of a delegation and in our delegation was a former head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And uh, as we would discuss with the Chinese ministers and top officials about technological cooperation and progress, uh, there was always this rather chilling fear on the part of the national security interests that uh, there really couldn't be any cooperation that would yield any benefits. Uh, I wanted to focus more on health care and areas where AI might provide some great advances and where we could cooperate and, and uh, make uh, 
progress, but it's hard to separate <laughs> sometimes the, as the lines converge between healthcare and uh, other human enterprises, uh, sometimes it becomes more difficult to control the outcome of progress. And you're doing fantastic work just building these people-to-people -people relationships and trust between individuals uh, on both sides, uh, which is something that I think came up a little bit during the CSIS leadership conference that you participated in recently. Could you reflect on some of your takeaways and uh, share with the listeners uh, yes, this CSIS, now that's the uh, Council for Strategic and International Studies, but a very prestigious organization led and, uh, and influenced by the top leaders in, uh, in the areas of strategic and international studies. Our topic was to be broad on innovation and innovation policy. But very quickly, our entire panel uh, came to the conclusion that we didn't have an effective innovation policy in the United States, at least something comparable to what's being implemented in China, Korea, and other places. And if we were to have an innovation policy, it would need to start with a strong patent system and patent reform. I think these were excellent uh, kind of general observations. So I, I found the panel to be very helpful. And he also uh, acted- By the way, I give a lot of credit to Judge Paul Michel, uh, my colleague of 22, 24 years, however long we served together there. He, uh, he has been influential at CSIS for some time. I think he was the inspiration behind this panel. And it, of course, featured strong voices from different political and uh, different sectors of the uh, intellectual property community. But again, there was consensus that we don't have a good innovation policy and that it would have to start with patent reform. Did you get a sense that those views were resonating with the audience and things would move forward in the right direction? Yes, I did. I felt like this audience was uh, in tune with that. We discussed things like the uh, the lack of a effective system of injunctions in the United States and how the remedy for trespass on property rights is to remove the trespasser. That was understood. And I think we also came to the conclusion that the gap between our understanding at this CSIS conference and the understanding of Congress was a significant gap. And you and Judge Michelle, I think, have been sterling examples of judges who have remained active after stepping off the bench. Most judges, they hang up their shingle, so to speak, and they enjoy their retirement on the golf course and grandchildren and all that. Uh, but two of you have been tireless in how you have been advocating for intellectual property rights, patent rights. Uh, what drives you? I think just the importance of the subject and having spent, you know, at least 35 years now teaching patent law and, and observing the deterioration of many of its incentives and it causes me great concern that we won't preserve for the next generation the value that uh, 
patent law and its incentives have brought to our generation. And uh, our viewers should know that you started a series called Raiders Ruminations <laughs> on IP Watchdog. Uh, I commend those articles to their reading, but tell us uh, some highlights and what how that came about. Well, so far I've addressed two topics, but I have a list of about 20, so <laughs> there's plenty to come. But uh, I, I addressed first the topic I felt was the most, uh, the topic most desperately in need of reform, and that's injunctions that we just talked about. And then I went on next to the uh, patent eligibility question and had three articles on that. And my next one's in process right now, and it'll address the PTAB. But I've got some fun topics. Uh, I'll, I'll write an article on the dumbest sentence in the history of uh, courts. I will have another uh, article on various other doctrines and, and items of interest. Now, is, is there a gap you think here in the U.S.? It seems like you think there might be you know, for the lack of innovation policy. Uh, you talk about China and how, I think you mentioned during the leadership conference, presidency has spoken extensively on multiple occasions in full speeches about the importance of intellectual property rights. Um, some members of Congress have been given very low scores recently uh, by a nonprofit organization that had looked at how each of them ruled on IP issues and courts as well. Uh, why is there this difference here in the US compared to somewhere like China? Well, China, of course, has a command economy where uh, President Xi can point his finger and immediately cause uh, billions of dollars of investment and he can reorganize their judiciary. They have uh, 26 specialized IP courts in, throughout the country. They give great attention to intellectual property and its enforcement. You can get an injunction in China uh, with 98% certainty within six to nine months, which makes that uh, intellectual property right a genuine, uh, valuable asset. Uh, our system has discounted it uh, significantly. And again, a part of it is that we don't have this kind of command economy. We are a free market system, at least freer than any place else in terms of our market system. And that means that our directions are dictated by the totality of individual and private decisions. And we have to encourage investment. We have to give incentives for the proper uh, development of market directions. And that's what the patent system is supposed to do. It's supposed to incentivize investment and uh, the creation of a capital for research and development. But as we undermine the strength of those incentives, uh, it becomes far more profitable to invest in cosmetics or or weight loss programs or anything else that uh, is less risky than intellectual property. How do they see us as a country, as a legal system, as a stakeholders in the IP system? Well, in a lot of ways, they've copied us. They have seen that we achieved great value in giving uh, strong intellectual property rights, and they have determined that uh, 
they can profit from that too. As a matter of fact, it's just very open that they wish to be the world's leading nation in uh, invention, innovation, and they see intellectual property as a way to do that, patent law in particular. And so they have strengthened it, but not just patent law. They've got a stronger trade secret law now. They've got uh, enhanced uh, trademark protections. With They always had a little problem with low quality marks, but they're making an effort to clean some of that up so that they will have a really compelling intellectual property system that at least at this point is at beginning to outcompete our system. It shared with us over the years because you have the benefit of many years of interactions with people um, from various parts of the Chinese IP stakeholder groups. Initially, my experience going to China was that people were very interested to hear what we were doing. They, they were almost sitting like students, eager to listen and eager to learn. Uh, and they always rolled out the red carpet and their hospi his hospitality was uh, impeccable. Uh, I don't know how things have been like since COVID. I've not been there, but your trajectory is even longer than that. So tell us uh, what you've noticed over the years. Well, and and I go still three or four times a year uh, to teach at Tsinghua and to to participate in other programs and and meet with government officials at the same time. So uh, I observe that uh, they continue to wish to learn, but they changed their attitude a little bit and now feel like uh, they're in a position to teach a little bit. <laughs> and so they're taking a, a little more aggressive stand. I think one place you see that quite prominently is in the uh, contest of anti-suit injunctions where uh, there are these competing court cases in various locations and the courts can begin to uh, threaten the parties that they must remain only in uh, the domestic courts, whether those domestic courts are Chinese or American or European. And as you know, there's a uh, WTO action going right now where the European Union has sued China over what it perceives as an excessive use of anti-suit injunctions. And in the last year or two, there have not been as many anti-suit injunctions. The, the WTO action may itself have, uh, have had some beneficial impact already. We How certainly don't need courts fighting with each other over preeminence in managing a dispute between two parties. What we should be doing is facilitating a system where the parties can see the value of settlement and see an opportunity to learn enough from the litigation to uh, reach an agreement. Do you see a same level of interest in students coming over to learn at our law schools, uh, lawyers coming for conferences here, and businesses just engaging with the legal community in the U.S.? Chinese yeah. businesses, I'm talking the, about. The interest is still there. It's a little more difficult now, as you know, Daryl. Uh, my classes, as you know, I've taught at GW for uh, well, going on three decades, actually going on four maybe, but uh, my classes used to have 30, 40 Chinese students. They still have 15 or 20, but it's a decline. It's a little harder for them to get a visa to come. 
Uh, and so the obstacles have made it more difficult, but the interest is still there. And uh, when I teach at Tsinghua, every one of my students at one point or another comes and asks, where can I go to school in the U.S.? And by the way, I'm going to tell them maybe they ought to be looking at Pennsylvania. <laughs> there's, there's an awful good teacher there, I know. <laughs> oh, that's very kind of you. With 1,300 million students, I'm sure our people in China, I'm sure there are enough good students to go around many law schools in the U.S. <laughs> I think that's true. And, and it benefits both of our countries. When I've often said that the most important U.S. export is its education, education systems, its classes. And uh, we should continue to offer that opportunity. Uh, are there trends in Chinese IT law that worry you? Well, I, I would, the, the trend I would like to see emphasized more is damages. Uh, there have been a few cases where uh, the injunction isn't the only remedy, where you've gone to the recovery of damages for past infringement. As you know, a injunction can inhibit future infringement, but there needs to be a remedy for what's already, the damage that's already occurred. That's damages. And there's an effort to make that happen. That's a good thing. That probably the topic of most importance in Chinese IP has been the expedited remedy system for pharmaceuticals, patterned loosely after our Hatch-Waxman Act. It was uh, uh, a part of the trade agreement uh, that was completed at the end of the, the Trump administration. And uh, frankly, myself and, and, uh, and others uh, consulted with China in trying to help them get their system uh, going. It, it isn't really a full Hatch-Waxman system, but it is an expedited remedy. It's working in many instances to, to resolve in a, a swift manner uh, issues of when and whether generics can enter the market and when they should be uh, blocked from entering the market by a uh, ongoing intellectual property right. So although they have a judiciary and they have a executive, and of course they also have a law making body that's in a way like our Congress, the three are really one and the same. Uh, as you mentioned, China is a central command economy. Uh, how has that influenced the way that Chinese IP jurisprudence works and Chinese IP policies work? Extensively, and it's really too big a topic to discuss quickly, but one way to understand it is that all of these officials, so whether judicial or, or even academic, are expected to adhere to state policy. And so when President Xi says openly in a speech that he wants to see uh, damages awarded to remedy past infringement, that will begin to happen. And uh, of course, it's the step from the order to the execution can be a significant one, but that's the, the key is that they do have a decided uh, policy of becoming the world's leading intellectual property nation. And uh, that needs to sound warning bells here in the United States. We need to be aware that 
they have that objective and they are acting on it. Do you see different regional legal cultures? Well, for example, in the US, the Second Circuit is a very different culture than the Ninth Circuit, the Federal Circuit from the DC Circuit. China is a much bigger place. Do you see different regional cultures in the same way we have in the US? Um, yes, but less so. Um, there, one criticism I've heard is that China almost has too much intellectual property law because you'll have uh, local authorities competing with regional authorities, competing with provincial authorities, all kind of wishing to be even more aggressive in enforcing intellectual property than their neighbors. And But there is a, a uniformity. They have a single uh, division at the Supreme People's Court that handles uh, intellectual property and, and requires a, a uniformity. They have three major uh, IP courts in Shanghai, Beijing, and Guangzhou. And then they have the 26 regional courts that I mentioned. So they have almost too much law, but it's all in one direction. And that's, we're going to enforce IP. So shifting gears now to you uh, and talk a little bit about your career trajectory. I was uh, in preparing for our conversation, looking at some of the past videos about you and you did a magnificent interview on C-SPAN back in the day on uh, Justice Kennedy's confirmation and the, <laughs> the breadth of questions and the detail was uh, quite amazing. I think you handled those questions better than many confirmation candidates themselves. Uh, to tell us uh, your thinking, you know, if you, if you can remember, uh, of that episode and how you prepared for those questions? Well, I when I worked in the Senate Judiciary Committee for a decade or so, uh, Senator Hatch, the late Senator Hatch, uh, my dear, dear friend, uh, did task me with the responsibility of, uh, of helping candidates with uh, their confirmation process. And so he would send me to candidate after candidate and have me brief them on the individual senators and the likely questions. And uh, I developed some expertise in how to deal with all of that. Uh, that also... Uh, helped because Senator Hatch was probably the leading uh, Republican senator in confirming many Supreme Court justices and failing to uh, confirm, for instance, Senate, uh, Judge Bork, who would have been a magnificent justice. But uh, in each of those instances, I would spend time with the candidates and and give them an extensive briefing and help them understand how they could navigate a rather difficult uh, process. What lessons uh, in leadership did you learn from Senator Hatch, having worked with him all those years? Oh, boy. You know, I think the touching thought that comes to my mind first is how much attention Oren gave to individuals. You know, he was involved in setting national policy, but he always had time to stop and talk to whoever was in his office. He, he took great interest in people like Muhammad Ali. He took great interest in, in uh, the downwinders. You won't know who that is, but Maybe you will from the Oppenheimer movie. The Southern Utah was exposed to the radiation in 
many of the early A-bomb tests, and they suffered some great health consequences, which Oren took an interest in helping to uh, correct. But not just there. It, he would take interest in orphan drug patients. Those are patients suffering from maladies which are almost too rare to justify a significant uh, uh, pharmaceutical investment. But he would figure out a way to incentivize those companies. Again, we don't give them orders here in the U.S., but we incentivize them. And so he had an Orphan Drug Act. Of course, he was instrumental in Hatch Waxman, but and a lot of other legislation. But I think the point I'm making is that he was motivated by the individual people and and the effort to really improve individual lives. It wasn't for him just a vote counting exercise. It was a question of how could he help somebody. Thanks. Take us back to your first day at the Federal Circuit in 1990. The court at that point was not even 10 years old yet. Uh, it's fairly new uh, and you were one of the pioneers in the sense. How was it like that? It was a wonderful time. Of course, I was serving with Howard Markey and Giles Rich and Helen Neese and Glenn Archer. All of these were gigantic personalities and people who were confident of their views, but very accommodating of each other and very willing to uh, talk through an issue. I, I can remember the first case I was assigned to write, uh, I had Polly Newman and Helen Neese on the panel, and they each went a different direction on the case. It was an ine inequitable conduct case, and I was in the middle. And I can remember each of them coming to me on at least one or two occasions, and I would tell them what I was thinking, and they would try to influence me, but it was a cooperative procedure. It was a respectful procedure. Uh, I guess you can hear me feeling little pangs of uh, remorse over the way my colleague Polly Newman's being treated now. I just that sort of thing would have never happened uh, in that era where people respected each other so and took care of each other. Ah, well. What do you think has changed? Well, personalities, of course. You get new judges and and that changes things. There was in that early day a common venture. We were really in the same boat, rowing the same direction to try and get intellectual property, patent law back on course. But we had other areas of law too. And we were interested in all of them and seeing that those could be uh, strengthened in a fair and balanced way. I, I get a very different impression as I read the cases today um, that the personal agendas have become greater than the mission of the court to strengthen and unify patent law for starters, but the other areas where the court has responsibility as well. Well, do you think do you think that uh, as successful as the experiment that the Court of the Fe Appeals for the Federal Circuit has been, uh, now is the time to relook and see whether or not its continued relevance uh, is well. There's been the some country. real shifts there, Daryl. Uh, 
I have watched the statistics. Uh, 60, maybe as much as 70% of their cases now come from the PTAB. That's an administrative action with a single issue and a high standard of review. It, it's the simplest case in the world. I worry that uh, the opportunities to get that uh, boat moving towards a strengthened patent law are becoming less uh, apparent. You, you talked about in an earlier interview the importance of having heroes. You talked about uh, Madison, you talked about Story, Leonard Han. Uh, it was a great interview, and it, clearly you had given a lot of thought to not just the individuals, but the work they, they had done. Do we have these heroes today? Well, I don't see them as prominently today. Uh, yes, I don't get me started on Joseph's story. He, he was uh, a, a grand uh, example of someone who devoted his life to constitutional and patent law, writing extensively on both. But uh, And he kind of inspired me to, to head in that same direction a bit. And I don't see too many people spending their time thinking about Joseph Story and Learned Hand and Giles Rich, who are three of my great admired uh, heroes in intellectual property. One of the questions uh, that was asked to you during the C-SPAN interview was uh, what you would look for, what the committee would look for in judicial candidates. And you talked about competence, integrity, and you spot you called the most interesting one of all, judicial philosophy. So what would you say, reflecting back on your years as a judge, was your judicial philosophy? Well, I tried hard to apply the law as written, not what I might want it to be. You know, I a, a classic divide in that area is that uh, we have great respect for juries in our system. Now, juries do not always work with great efficiency in patent law where you have highly technical scientific questions. Although I came to understand as I sat as a trial judge and administered jury after jury, that if you instructed them, if you educated them, if you gave them the opportunity, they would do magnificently well, just as well as any jurist sitting alone. But uh, that's, uh, I think, an example of an area where our system is different from the rest of the world. And yet, if we work at it, we can make our system the best in the world. Thanks. So now then fast forward to the time that you were appointed chief judge. I had the privilege of being there that summer and seeing your chambers both as a circuit judge and as a chief judge. Uh, and it was a historic moment. Tell us uh, about that transition and what you had hoped to achieve as chief judge. And if you would, if you think you had achieved that by the time you left. Well, the, the first challenge I hit was to get our court on an electronic filing system. We had our own unique system that was out of sync with the rest of the district courts so that when the district courts would send a judgment, uh, it had to be done with boxes and papers. They couldn't just push an, a button and send it to us electronically. And uh, I think we achieved a great deal of that in the years that I was chief judge. Uh, ultimately, we needed to replace our clerk to get that to happen, but we made it happen. Uh, 
I think another thing I was quite aware of was the international reach of intellectual property and technology knows no boundaries. We understand that laws do. They are set by uh, borders and different systems of governance. But I always thought that with awareness of each other and and uh, a close eye to what other judges were doing with often the same case in a different jurisdiction, we could soften, if not eliminate those differences and make intellectual property work as a uh, system that honored the value of technology worldwide. I should mention, because uh, people often don't see what's going on behind closed doors in the court, that perhaps never before or since your time at the court have there been so many people from all over the world that have had a chance to spend some time, whether as a jurist in residence, a scholar in residence, uh, a practitioner in residence, who understand how the federal circuit works to interact with the clerks and the judges and the staff. Uh, and that was tremendous in terms of just creating the goodwill and understanding that you talked about. Well, thank you. We, we did almost always have a, uh, a judge or two from foreign jurisdictions, often Korea, Japan, occasionally China, uh, Europe, that would come and, and sit with us and, and observe the cases and how they were um, processed by me and my staff and then to watch them argued publicly. And uh, there was value to that. You, you'll remember also that I took the whole court uh, to Tokyo, Seoul, Beijing, Brussels. We had uh, these in London, we had these international judicial conferences, as we call them. <laughs> Has, have these things been institutionalized? Does well, the federal circuit today still do that? I, that they happen not um, on an institutional level. They happen uh, occasionally, um, but not, uh, I think, with a plan to achieve some kind of cooperation. So turning now to GW and your role as a professor, highly unusual for a judge to be so invested in education the way that you have been. Uh, and generations of students have come through, not just at GW, I should mention during my interview at Tsinghua, of course, and many other of these other places. Why was it important to you not just to be a judge, but to be an educator? Well, two things. My parents were both teachers, so I had kind of a, I was raised in a teaching family. But uh, two, I, I recognized that I could touch so many more lives in a classroom than I could in a courtroom. <laughs> you know, I'm dealing with two parties in a courtroom and I write a decision and people read that. That had an impact I was teaching 100, 120 students in some of my GW classes. By the way, they're down to around 60 or 70 today. Partially, that's because of the declining value of patents and patent law. And so there's fewer hirings and students take notice of that. But still, we still... I can reach 60, 70 students at uh, GW, usually 40 to 50 at Tsinghua. Uh, I will end up teaching at Tokyo or Melbourne or, or somewhere else usually once a year and get 20 to 30 students there. That has an impact. Family. So one thing I do remember uh, while I was uh, with you in your chambers is uh, 
the 4th of July and you would invite the clerks and externs and interns, uh, families, and your family was there to watch the fireworks. Uh, I know family is a big part of your life. Can you talk to us a bit about how that has influenced you and your work? Yes, well, I, I can say with happiness that uh, my daughter, getting her doctorate at uh, University of Colorado, got an NIH grant. And she's working on uh, genetic markers for chronic pain. My son is a uh, engineer at a startup uh, biopharma company in uh, the Raleigh Durham Triangle in North Carolina. So I've I've got a couple of children who are invested in technology and its advance, and I have other magnificent children. My daughter's a leading executive at uh, Amazon. I've got another daughter who is a musician. <laughs> so yes, I'm very happy. Any With English me. majors? What's that? Any English majors? <laughs> you know, I I think I struck out there. I don't think I got a single one of those. <laughs> and and yet it's remarkable. I think a couple of people who had interviewed you before also indicated how remarkable it was for you as somebody without the technical background to have made such contributions in the technical field of patent law and IP more generally. Uh, well, thank you. I I I love technology and I have found that, well, I just testified at a case in the Denver District Court as an expert last week on pretty high-level technology in the, uh, it's actually a way of projecting information through a little monocle uh, attached to your helmet or something for military purposes or for business executives who are working and want to keep an eye on other things. And, uh, you know, when you put your mind to it, you can learn enough to make a contribution in those new technologies as well. It sounds like you actually made it a strength, an asset rather than a liability. And you <laughs> talked about the, the craft of uh, getting the words right for claims and even in your judgments. Uh, I have a, a recommendation there. If there's a, someone without a extensive technical training, and by the way, even those with a technical training are going to find themselves in a very narrow specialized area, and they need to project their knowledge into a new area, get yourself a book. You know, read a book on biotech. I read two or three of them, and then read yourself a book on AI. And then read yourself a book on uh, circuitry. And, you know, you can get small books that give you enough to get yeah. started. And then as you need more, you can delve a little deeper. Well, that's a wonderful reminder of not being too caught up in the paper chase. Because even as you describe those examples, I think about President Abraham Lincoln who was very much a self-taught man and wrote the most wonderful prose and made the most strategic decisions uh, throughout his presidency. Well, and he was quite the technology uh, uh, advocate as well. Now, as you remember, he had a patent himself, but he advocated always for the advance of technology, mostly in the military sector, because, of course, he was consumed by the war that he was part of. But but technology often decides conflicts of that nature as well. Last question for you. So when we're recording this, we're about a week away from your birthday, your 75th birthday. <laughs> uh, well, happy birthday in advance, first of all. Uh, Thank you. And second, uh, what birthday plans do you have? Uh, 
walking my dogs on the beach at least three times <laughs> and then probably uh, taking a view, abuse from a few family and friends that are here in North Carolina with me. <laughs> well, I hope you have a very wonderful birthday. Uh, thank you for your service all these years and uh, your continued service and the difference that you make, not just nationally, but internationally. And the lives that you have touched, I think, much in the same way that your friend and mentor, uh, Senator Hatch, has done. Well, thank you. You, you touch me. Uh, uh, it's been a tough week. I, I lost another close friend, Joe Lieberman, recently. He was a very close friend. And I, I don't want to lose any more friends. I, <laughs> but I guess that's part of life, too. And we cherish each day as they come. That's a, a good, good advice. Good <laughs> advice. That's well, thank you for spending part of this day with us, and uh, thank you for joining us on our profiles in leadership series. Daryl, it's it's just great to be with you, and I uh, I hope we find many ways to cooperate in the future. I would like that. Thank you.